Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the host, and in particular Ilya, uh, for making this arrangement here. It's really fascinating to see how this idea of uh, national multi-stakeholder dialogues in form of a national intergovernance forum is mushrooming around all Europe. And I enjoyed very much the first discussion this morning when you have seen really the multi-stakeholder dialogue in practice where people from the business, from the civil society, from the government, you know, we are trying to find solutions for problems on the national level, in particular here in the field of education, because this is a shared responsibility for, for everyone. And uh, as I will also outline in my presentation, the only way to settle problems in the internet is via uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue, where all stakeholders are involved. And what uh, James just uh, outlined also was, it's not so easy that uh, technical people listening to lawyers and lawyers to uh, civil society organizations and governments and all this, so it has to be learned. But this is a new way how policy has to be developed, so it's a step in an uncharted territory. We have not yet these experiences how policy is made in the Internet age, but one thing is for sure, the Internet has changed the world, and we have to accept this and we have to look forward how we implement uh, you know, uh, policies in this new world. My subject is that I will speak a little bit about this growing global um, complexity uh, with regard to internet governance and um, so to understand better what's happening today and tomorrow I thought it's a probably a good idea to go a little bit back to the history and first to understand, you know, where the Internet comes from. And we should not forget that the Internet has started already in the 1950s and 60s. It was primarily a research project financed by the U.S. Department of Defense to look into opportunities, you know, how, uh, what uh, communication system would be needed to survive a nuclear war. And um, the, the, the real start for the Internet, some people have uh, no clue about this was uh, when the Soviet Union at this time started the Sputnik in 1957 and this was seen as a challenge by the US military and they said okay you know if they attack for instance our communication center we have a centralized communication system you know what would be our reaction and so the research which started then in the 60s uh, by the uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, financed by the Department of Defense, was is there an, an, uh, you know, an opportunity or an option to have a decentralized communication system where you have to destroy all the communication nodes if you want to destroy the whole communication system? And so the saying was, you know, we need more nodes than the Russians have rockets. So that, uh, that we can survive, that means in case one of communication network is destroyed, we can bypass this and can th uh, look for, for another channel. And so the idea of a decentralized communication system with no central authority, with no central switch, you know, um, was developed in the 1960s. And the first network which uh, you know, emerged from this research was in 1969 when four computers were connected, one in Stanford, one in Santa Barbara, one in Los Angeles, and one in Utah, where all the four computers communicated on equal footing. So this was really a revolution because all communication systems from the past had more or less a hierarchical structure. You know, telecommunication is organized in form of a hierarchy. You know, you have country codes, city codes, and so a central switch broadcasting is a hierarchical system. There you have one transmitter which then sends to many people. That means all communication systems in the past has been hierarchical systems, but the internet is a network. And I think this is really important to understand because a lot of the problems which we see today are uh, you know, going back to the architecture of the internet as a decentralized network. And it's now thousands, ten thousand, hundreds thousands of network which are uh, connected. Each individual network can be managed and controlled, but it's nearly impossible, you know, to uh, control the internet as a whole um, because it's 
too big. And the problem is not what I see, but this is already my conclusion, and uh, I will lead you to my conclusion a little bit later, is that for a lot of groups, stakeholders, governments, also businesses, it's much more better to have all the citizens or customers in just one network because this is easier to control and then to have them spread around the broad variety of networks. I think going back to the, through the history, um, when then the Cold War became a little bit less cold through the phase of the time between the Soviet Union and the United States, the whole idea of this decentralized network was more or less overtaken by the academic world and they used it and developed it further in what I call a wave two. This was in particular after Windsurf and Bob Kahn um, uh, developed the TCP IP protocol, which enabled um, you know, that networks could communicate to other networks, not only computer with a network, but networks among networks. So it was internet. This was when the terminology was created. And I think this is for a lot of people the real birthday of the internet when uh, in 1974 the TCP IP protocol was invented. That's why we call Wind and Bob as the fathers of the internet. But uh, when Tim Berners Lee then invented the World Wide Web, this was the start of a th third wave. Um, it opened the door for all kinds of commercial services. I think before the World Wide Web, it was indeed mainly you know, um, academic uh, um, talent. But uh, with the World Wide Web, the door was open for a commercialization. This was also when suddenly the .com top-level domain became more important than the .edu top-level domain. I was teaching in the United States in Washington in 1992. At this time, it was still, you know, important if you wanted to be recognized to have a .edu domain and to have a .com domain, this was the bad, poop, the bad people. So the good people had a .edu domain for education, education systems at the U.S. universities have a .edu domain. But this has changed dramatically, and uh, today we have 120 million registrations under .com, and only you know less than one million under .edu. So uh, in, in so far, you know, the commercial wave started in with the World Wide Web. And, uh, you know, this was still a couple of hundred uh, millions people, um, 100, 200 million, not so much, but when it's crossed the one billion line in the, uh, in the year 2000, 2003, 2005, this became really a global issue, and the United Nations, uh, you know, tried to manage this and started the uh, World Summit on the Information Society in 2002, and the Internet was one of the main issues in this uh, uh, negotiations under the United Nations and the World Summit on Information Society uh, because the internet at this time became really a mass media and nowadays and what I call the wave five is now that nearly everybody and everything is connected to the internet even as James has mentioned um, objects now can be linked to the internet so the internet is everywhere in, in, in all parts of the society it's not just a network next to our real life, our real life is in the cyberspace. But it means there is no distinction anymore between what is the virtual life and what is the real life. So it means it's so interwoven that you cannot separate it, and this is, creates a new and much higher complexity. Um, you know, uh, to understand all this, it's, you know, I want to mention here only three elements. One is that all this is based on protocols and codes. That means the organizing of the communication in the internet was developed by the technical community itself, by the users and the providers of the services. And so they developed a certain procedure, you know, how to develop these norms and regulations. But it means the law book of the um, internet is more or less the book of the protocols, or as it called in the internet world, the RFCs, the request for comments. This was introduced in 1969 by Steve Brocker, who is now the ICANN chairman, and who said, okay, how we regulate the internet. Regulation was a certain, certain catchword also in the morning session. And his idea was, okay, first we have to identify the problem. What is the problem? And if we agree that this is a problem, then we ask for solutions. And we ask the people, you know, what will you see? What is the best solution? So they requested 
you know, there was a proposed solution and then they requested for comments. And the request for comment, you know, uh, was then debated. And when there was enough consensus among the community which discussed the issue, and then they said, okay, now we have rough consensus and this is adopted. And this was an open standard. Open means that you can enhance it. You know, if you have further developments, you can add an element and, you know, you can, um, you know, push the development forward. So it means no code should close the books, but it should open uh, the, uh, the, the, the opportunities for further enhancement. And I think this is a new way of quote unquote lawmaking. So because normally laws in society are made by a parliament with a simple majority, but it's a top-down process. But in the internet, you know, the regulation for the internet were developed in an open, transparent process, bottom up, by the people who are directly involved. I think this is really a revolution, this changes the way we organize our life and our society, and while this was developed in particular for technical codes and protocols, um, you know, this now moves also into a lot of our, uh, you know, policy making in uh, public policy issues, uh, intellectual property, freedom of expression, as we have just heard, a lot of other things, you know, are discussed now in a way which is different from traditional policy making. And all the protocols we have here has been developed in this way. And uh, in this process of self-regulation, a lot of institution emerged because it cannot be done just by individuals. So they had to organize themselves. And so the institutions which are now part of the internet ecosystem has been emerged in this process of uh, making the protocols. I think the first one was the, in one of the first one in 1979 already, the uh, Internet uh, uh, Configuration Council or something like that, which is now the Internet Architecture Board. Uh, in 86, then the Internet Engineering Task Force was established, which takes care now on all the Internet protocols and codes. YANA, which manages the main database of the Internet, uh, was formally established in 1990. Uh, RIPE NCC, you know, uh, is the other regional Internet registries, which manages the IP addresses, were established in 1992. Um, ISOC, uh, which takes care of a lot of uh, social, economic, and cultural dimensions of the Internet, was established in 1992. And ICANN in 1998, which manages now the domain name system, in particular also the generic uh, top level domains, mainly by the United States government with uh, involvement of the European Union. And the final thing which is important for to understand all this is that you have to understand that the internet is not organized on a country basis, it's in a global nature. So it was only, you know, as a second or third step that John Postel said, oh, it's probably not a better idea if we give countries also a top level domain. Originally, there was no plan to have country called top level domains. Postel just at this time in the 70s who introduced the domain name system said, okay, we have three for the US, dot, uh, gov, dot mil, and dot EU, and three for the world, dot org, dot net, dot com. And uh, the idea to have country called top level domains came only later. But because the internet is more or less a borderless space, so that means it does not mirror the national borders. And I think this is this global nature, the borderless nature of the internet is a very important element. And the other one which is, uh, and, and, and this, this architecture has produced this end-to-end -end principle. Because in the internet, as I said, there is no central authority. All the servers and routers which are, you know, connecting the end users are more than some uh, devices. So they, they are not interested what is in the package, what is the content which is flowing from one end to the other end. They just, you know, look at the address and send it to the package, you know, to the uh, destination. And in so far, the end-to-end -end principle, the open architecture, uh, and the, the non-existence from a central authority has allowed um, this what we call today the innovation without permission. That means that the end user is the powerhouse of the internet. So it's not a powerhouse in the center which controls the internet. It's a decentralized system and all the, let's say, all the decision-making power is in the hand of the end users. That's why uh, empowerment of end users is such an important element. And we have seen, uh, you know, in the last years, how the internet has empowered civil society organizations, individuals, but also a lot of businesses, because all the power is on the edges. 
And this innovation without permission is really a very, very important thing. I think in the past, normally, if somebody had an idea, wanted to, to, to create something, he had to go to a central authority or to a state authority and has to ask, is this allowed or not? Because, you know, uh, laws regulated what was allowed or not. The telecommunication law regulated very clearly which kind of devices you could use, uh, which spectrum, uh, you know, what is available for uh, sending out, uh, you know, messages or what else. So that means uh, traditional laws regulated very clearly what is legal, what is illegal, and you needed a permission if you wanted to do something. But the internet has more or less removed this, this, this uh, uh, authorization because more or less an internet, everybody can start something. Um, uh, Larry Page did not ask anybody whether it's allowed to start a search entity. He just did it and has now, you know, um, billions of users on Google. Mark Zuckerberg never asked him whether it's allowed to uh, start a social network. So uh, he just did it uh, without any any authorization or license or whatever. So, and I think this principle, innovation without permission, is really a very key principle and have to be understood fully. Uh, that um, also, you know, uh, good governance means to enable the end user that they can come with innovation because innovation and creativity is the driving force for economic growth, for job creation. As we had also in the morning session, we have this shortage on educated people, so it means the push for the economic growth in a country comes, you know, with a higher level of education, with more creativity and innovation. And a final thing here to this slide is that the resources we, we, we use for the internet are more or less unlimited resources which are not linked to a territory. These are domain names and IP addresses. Google.com is just a domain name and they were able to build an empire on top of a domain name. So just register for a couple of dollars. So um, the domain name space is like the territory in the real space. If you want to do something in the real space, you have to buy land, then you build a factory, then you have to hire people, all this, you know, you, you need a certain territory, you need a, a materialized basis for that. But in the internet, you just, you know, uh, register a domain name and then you can build your factory on top of a domain name. So, and this is a cheap resource, this is more or less an unlimited resource, and it's not linked to a territory. All the resources we know from the industrial age are territorial based resources and uh, say are limited resources. Oil is in the Arab world, so it's territory there. Gas is in, the, in Russia, so it means it's not in Germany, it's uh, not in Bulgaria. So, uh, and, and that's a very limited resources. All the wars in the last two, three hundred years were about resources, how to get control over resources. But it makes no sense to start a war to get control over IP addresses. Because you have zillions of IP addresses and, you know, it makes, it's unlimited. If you need an IP address, send a request to arrive and, 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 and you will get your package. If, if, there, if you can document the request. The same is domain names now with the more than 1,000 uh, new applications for generic top-level domains. That means if you want to have a new top-level domain, send a request, send an application to ICANN, you have to pay a certain fee, but then, then you can get it. And I think this is important to understand the nature of the resources in the internet, IP addresses and domain names. There are unlimited resources which are not linked to a certain territory. You know, it's also good to remember some of the concepts, you know, which were in the beginning of the internet. Tim Barnes, Lee, the fathers of the internet, had here this very nice, nice uh, quotation there is the idea that society can run without a hierarchical bureaucratic government being involved in every step if only we can hit on the right set of rules for peer-peer -peer interaction. Our design of the internet and the web is a search for a set of rules which will allow computers to work together in harmony. And our spiritual and social quest is for a set of rules which allow people to work together in harmony. Certainly it's a little bit romantic romantic and, and an illusion, but you should understand, this was a driving force uh, behind the makers of the internet. Or as Dev Clark has said in uh, one of the first leaders of the ITF, where he said, we do not believe in kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus, factual approach, 
and running code. And uh, you know, rough consensus and running code is still the main slogan for the uh, internet engineering task force and for the internet community. Or even more radical, King uh, Peter Barlow's declaration of cyber independence from Davos, when he said, governments of the industrial world, you read giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mine. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Thirdly, this is, was a rather radical statement 15 years ago, and we understand now in a multi-stakeholder world that we need the government. So that means there will be no internet without the government. So I think this is what we have understood. But it's good to know, you know, if. Uh, what has been the discussions 15 years ago among the internet community, so that the government certainly will not play uh, a, a decisive and controlling role on it. They are, they are needed, they are part of the process, and so that means uh, Jim Barlow was not right in, in, in arguing this way, but he put the finger on a certain way and said, you know, the time is over, their governments control um, the, uh, the internet as a whole. And I think Lessig opened the eye a little bit for us when he in his book in 1998, uh, more or less uh, said that the, in, in the internet, in cyberspace, the technical code is the law. So while in the past the lawmakers created the space for the code makers, now in the internet it's are the code makers who are creating the space for the lawmakers. And so we have to understand the relationship between code makers and lawmakers. The problem here, what I see, is also the, the lawmakers you know, are, are, have a certain accountability. So they are elected, and you know, if they are doing bad things, then they are not re-elected. But you know, what about the accountability and responsibility of the code makers? But it means here is still something to do where we have to strengthen systems of transparency and accountability for the code makers and the real interaction, the multi-stakeholder dialogue between code makers and lawmakers. But it was very good that, that uh, Lessig, you know, uh, made this point, and he made very clear that code is made by man. And a code can open avenues, can close streets. So that means, uh, it doesn't mean that code is good per se. So because code is made by men, and, 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 and people who make code have a certain interest, aspirations. They are not 100% neutral, even if they say, okay, they are only technical oriented. And so far, we have to understand much better the relationship between technology, society, law, policy, and the economy, and the human rights dimension behind this. And it's also very nice to uh, say, you know, to remember what Vin Cerf has said just recently, two years ago, uh, when he was asked, um, he had visited Australia, and he was asked, Mr. Cerf, did you expect when you invented the TCP IP protocol in 1974 that we have now two billion internet users? So, and he said, certainly not, but, um, and, and this is an important point here, and then answered, the question was, would it be something that could be rolled out to the rest of the world? We didn't know for sure, but when we worked on it, we decided not to patent, not to copyright, not to control, but to share everything we knew about the internet design to the general public all around the world. What's amazing is that it was a US Department of Defense project when we were in the middle of the Cold War. In spite of all that, we made all this completely available to everybody. And the only reason it was possible is nobody paid any attention to us. So, and I think this is really a, a very in, in, interesting uh, quotation. And, you know, I want to analyze it a little bit more in detail. The first thing what he said was, we, we decided not to patent, not to copyright, not to control, but to share. So the internet is about sharing. I think this is a, a key element of it. Uh, just recently, and when ISOC celebrated its 20th anniversary, there was a huge conference in, in, um, in Geneva. And I had to chair a session with Vin Cerf as the key speaker. And my first question was, I confronted him with this quotation and said, you know, what, what would have been if you would have decided otherwise, if you would have copyrighted or trademarked or patented the TCP IP protocol, then he would say probably I would be a rich man now, but we would have no internet. So <laughs> that means the, 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 the openness, the idea of sharing, not to patent, not to copyright it, has opened the door for this uh, incredible development. I think this is 
uh, in particular, you know, we have now a discussion about sharing, you know, as a, it's part of the human right to share, you know, what I have. The, the concept of sharing is complicated. It has a lot of complicated implications. But on the other hand, it was the starting point for the internet. And if you try to stop uh, the concept of sharing by introducing very specific regulation, which would make sharing of information uh, illegal, uh, it's, you know, would, would really strangle it, the internet, as we know. So that means you have to find a way to balance conflicting interests. And the second thing is really also important is that we were in the Cold War, this was really very strategic, but you know, we, we did it, we gave it to the, the world. You know, we did send it to China, we did send it to the Soviet Union, so there was no problem with that because nobody, nobody paid any attention to it. So that means a lot of things can be done as long as uh, you are in a niche, as you know, a small group. This has changed now. I think governments now understand quite well. So that means you are not in the shadow of governmental regulation anymore if you are dealing with the internet. And this makes it much more complicated, and I will show this in the second part of my presentation now. So when the World Summit on the Information Society started in Geneva 2003, this was really the beginning of a conflict which will go you know, in the year 2020 or 2030 for the next year. So this was only the beginning of a conflict. When the controversy started, who controls all this? Uh, critical internet resources like the main name IP addresses. Is it just ICANN, the United States government, or should it be the rest of the world? So the, um, the uh, question was, you know, what is the role of governments? All this internet is managed by non-governmental stakeholders, the technical community, uh, at large civil society groups, uh, the business groups, and what is the role of governments? And uh, I remember in 2002 in Geneva when when Madame Wu from the Internet Society of China and the representative of the Chinese government came in and said, okay, private sector leadership for the internet was good for one million internet users, but now with one billion internet users, we need governmental leadership. So this was the, the conflict, you know, private sector leadership for the internet or governmental leadership for the internet. And uh, there was, it was China versus the United States of America. And it was the ITU as an intergovernmental organization versus ICANN. So, and, um, you know, there was, in two or three in Geneva, was no way to bridge this conflict. It was really, you know, uh, 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 you know two totally different concepts, you know, where in a battle against each other. And the compromise was then, okay, we have no answer at this moment. You, we do not want that the whole summit collapses, so let's create a working group. And so the member states of the United Nations asked the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan at this time, you know, to establish a working group and at least to start to define what internet governance could be, because everybody had a different understanding what internet governance is. So, and here comes now that in this working group on internet governance, the conceptual design for what in, of the understanding of internet was more or less developed within this group, which was a multi-stakeholder group. It was not an intergovernmental working group, as normally in the United Nations. In this working group of internet governance, where you know technical experts, private sector representatives, civil society representatives, academic representatives were a member of the group, and they came out that you know in this conflict between private sector leadership versus uh, governmental leadership, that that is the wrong question. So the internet does not lead a leader, so because the internet is a decentralized network where all involved <coughs> stakeholders have to work together. So more or less the wiki rejected the concept of one stakeholder leadership, a hierarchical system which we know from the real world where you're at the top you have one decision maker, it's the Pope or the Secretary General or the President or whatever. So there is no need for this. It's a decentralized mechanism where all stakeholders are needed and to collaborate, to coordinate, to communicate each other and to find uh, case by case solutions for, for the issues. And so the pro definition, you know, which was finally adopted and later also rubber stamped by the heads of states from more than 150 uh, members of the United Nations with uh, their heads of states and ministers in Tunis that internet governance is the development and application by governments, the private sector and civil society in their respective roles 
of shared principle norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs that shape the evolution and use of the Internet. In this definition, there are, again, two very crucial elements in it. The first thing is application by governments, private sector, and civil society in their respective roles. So it means all stakeholders are involved, but the role of the stakeholders is different. So that means the business cannot substitute the government, and the civil society cannot substitute the business, and governments cannot substitute the civil society. So it means each stakeholder has a special role, but they have to work together. So the respective roles make clear that, uh, you know, this is not a competition among the stakeholders. So this is an invitation for collaboration. And the other key word here in this definition is shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs. Again, the concept of sharing. Sharing is really a key element in the Internet. But this is difficult, and in particular, if you combine shared with decision-making procedures, how shared decision-making procedures, how this can be implemented in a world where we have a clear power structure in each uh, government, Imagine now the, the, the new president of China, who will be elected in, in March. Um, you know, he has decision-making power now, certainly, on the internet. And then somebody comes to civil society, comes to the president of China and say now, according to the definition, you have now to share your decision-making capacity with the civil society. So this is a big issue. So it's not settled. We have the definition, but it's a long way uh, for implementation. And it's really, it will change the understanding how policy is made in, I think, in the 21st century. So this issue will not go away in the next three or five years. This will be, remain a key issue for the rest of this century. So uh, one of the outcomes from the um, wiki was also the establishment of the Internet Governance Forum. Um, and, um, but there was no consensus, at least in the group, how to exercise oversight over ICANN, which manages the critical resources. So the um, compromise finally then in Tunis was that a number of general principles were accepted in the so-called Tunis Agenda. The Internet Governance Forum was established, and they said, okay, we cannot agree on an oversight mechanism for ICANN. That means for some people it was the establishment of an um, internet, intergovernmental Internet Council, something like United Nations for the Internet, or a security council for the internet, or something like that, but this failed. So it means there was no consensus, and so the heads of states in Tunis in 2005 decided, let's start a process and look what can be done in the future. And the process was, you know, in a cryptic way called a process of enhanced cooperation. That so means let's move forward, uh, develop cooperation, and then let's wait and see what will come out. So what happened since Tunis? Um, you know, I have here four um, uh, uh, chapters and, and we'll, we'll go a little bit through this, uh, uh, four, uh, five chapters. The first thing is, ICANN has changed. ICANN has changed, I would not say dramatically, but the relationship between the US government and ICANN, you know, has really changed substantially. Originally, it was a memorandum of understanding between the US government and ICANN. They changed it to a joint project agreement, which gave ICANN already a lot of more independence. And when the Obama administration started in 2009, one of the first things they did was to give ICANN um, you know, independence. So that means the US government is not anymore you know, the oversight body for, the, for ICANN. So the affirmation of commitment gives ICANN an independence and meanwhile ICANN has made a number of decisions which were opposed by the US government. So the US government plays its role now via the Governmental Advisory Committee. That's why the, the Governmental Advisory Committee is much more you know, uh, higher in its profile. But uh, the uh, US government has no uh, anymore a unilateral control over ICANN. It has still a control over YANA. Uh, because this is a bilateral contract, and in so far, the, the, the database, uh, the, uh, you know, is still certainly uh, at the heart of the problem. Uh, but ICANN, as such, is um, rather independent now from the U.S. government, and the review, the oversight over ICANN, is done by a decentralized, multi-stakeholder review process, uh, where you know, on a regular basis, um, oversight function is executed by um, a team 
which is, um, includes, you know, high-level governmental representative in the first review team. There was the former director general from the European Commission, Colosanti. There was a vice minister from China. There was a vice minister from the U.S. government. But it means the oversight is done in an innovative way by a review mechanism which is a decentralized and multi-stakeholder mechanism because you have four review mechanisms. One for the board, accountability and transparency. One for the WIS, the privacy issues in, 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 in an ICANN. One for competition and uh, uh, yeah, a, a force process. So the IGF has meanwhile, uh, it's an incredible success story. So there was a lot of doubts in 2006 you know, when the first IGF took place is this really, you know, uh, a good idea? And today we can say yes. After the IGF in Baku, you know, it's more or less clear there is no alternative um, for the IGF uh, if you want to develop policies in the internet field. You have to have this form of multi-stakeholder dialogue, uh, which which uh, body which has no decision-making capacity, but which has the power, you know, to attract a lot of different stakeholders and to produce arguments which will then help uh, uh, bodies who, which have a, a decision-making capacity to make the right decisions, to make informed decisions. So it means decision-making capacity, again, is decentralized. The IGF is not a centralized decision-making capacity, but it's a unique platform in the center of the internet the development, you know, which enables all stakeholders to get the knowledge, to understand better what they are doing in their special capacity. The United Nations, you know, is, is uh, still playing an important role and probably it's growing. So they had a report by the UN Secretary General uh, and consultations on enhanced cooperation that is still pending. Nobody really knows what enhanced cooperation is and could be. Then, you know, three uh, developing countries, Brazil, India and South Africa, proposed in the second committee of the General Assembly the establishment of a so-called Council for Internet-related policies. This is a very controversial proposal, but you know, it's, it, it shows that uh, governments in the world you know, want to have a place where they discuss public policy issues. Um, and then uh, the, the, the so-called Shanghai Group, which includes China and the Russian Federation and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Turkmenistan and some others, proposed a so-called Code of Conduct for Cybersecurity in the first committee of the General Assembly. And then the third committee, the Human Rights Council, um, also are working on internet governance in the General Assembly. And just recently, the Human Rights Council adopted a landmark resolution, which says that the human rights we enjoy offline, we have also online. So that means it makes very clear this very simple short sentence adopted by the Human Rights Council that there should be no differences with regard to human rights in the offline or online world. So that means there are no need also to, to have new human rights for the online world. So we have human rights, and as James has outlined, this goes back to 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the United Nations, and in the Council of Europe case to 1915, when the European Convention was adopted. The ITU is certainly a player. In Guadalajara in 2010, this was the last plenipotentiary conference of the ITU, uh, for the first time the ITU uh, was invited to enhance the cooperation with ICANN. So ITU ICANN are still a very polarized uh, relationship. So, but, you know, the, uh, in Guadalajara the, there was at least, you know, some hope that there could be a little bit more than than a cold war between the two organizations, something like a peaceful coexistence. Uh, but nothing has been implemented so far, so that means we are wait and see. And there will be some landmark conferences in the weeks and months ahead. In uh, two weeks from now in Dubai, there will be the World uh, Telecommunication Conference, which uh, renews the International Telecommunication Regulation from 1988. And this is seen as a, as a lacmus uh, test, you know, how far some governments will go uh, in regulating the internet, whether they want to use this opportunity to extend telecommunication regulation to the internet, or whether <coughs> the multi-stakeholder model will be seen as the guiding principle for the management of the internet. And then we had since Tunis also this, you know, you cannot see it here, uh, in the, uh, the, the ACTA debate, which was very close related to the um, the internet, it means the World Trade Organization, the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, WTO, dealt with the issue and produced 
uh, as a side effect the ACTA agreement and this is a, a very good example that you see if you ignore the minus stakeholder principle which will happen. What will happen? You know ACTA was negotiated by governments only behind closed doors. So, uh, internet governance is open, transparent, involvement of all stakeholders. As soon as the results from this closed, top-down, behind closed doors process were known in the uh, draft agreement on ACTA, a storm started and people, 10,000 people were on the street and said, you know, you want to take away our freedom of the internet? No way. So that means this is really, the, the Commissioner Cruz then said in a conference in Berlin in May, oh, this was a wake-up call for Brussels. So only, you know, with this protest in the streets, now governments understand, oh, we have to change our way how we agree among ourselves. So I think this is an interesting lesson, and probably this is only the start of the process which will change the world of diplomacy in the years ahead. So what are the venues now in this year? Uh, what we see is a proliferation of all kinds of principles. I think while 10 years ago people had a certain you know, problems with principles because a principle means regulation of the internet. We do not want to regulate the internet. Internet should remain free. So, but nowadays, I think there's a different approach. People understand principles. In principle, principles are not bad. So you have to have some guidelines. So as it was pointed out also this morning, everybody is for freedom, but freedom is not unlimited. So it means we have to have certain balances, checks and balances. <coughs> and in so far, to have some guidelines is okay. The Council of Europe discussed, discovered this rather early and they adopted a, a, a document declaration of guiding principles with 10 principles. The OECD stepped in and developed a, a, a document with 14 principles for internet policy making. The G8 had a meeting uh, where they formulated six principles in Deauville on the level of the heads of state, so it has the signature from Mr. Obama, from Mr. Medvedev, from Madame Merkel, all this, you know, signed in, in the six principles from the will. Then the British foreign minister came recently and said, okay, here are my seven principles. There was a conference in Budapest uh, in October where then the Chinese minister came and said, here are my five principles. So, and then we have numerous business organizations, technical organizations, civil society organizations, which have proposed principles. So that means we have now 25 or more documents, you know, on internet governance principles. So, and it's going confusion. So the question is now, you know, what, uh, what, would, what are the right principles? So this is an invitation for principle shopping. You such a, this is a nice principle. I justify my good or bad behavior by referring to a principle which I like. So the Chinese vice minister in Budapest proposed as the first principle cyber sovereignty. So what does it mean cyber sovereignty? He was very clear by explaining cyber sovereignty means the extension of national sovereignty into cyberspace. Oh, how this will work. So if 190 member states of the United Nations extend their national sovereignty, both in brackets, their national territory into cyberspace, then we have a huge collision in cyberspace because we have so different national uh, legal orders, though so this will certainly lead to collisions and to conflicts. But it means we have to have a different approach. So we have to have some principles, but the principles have to reflect the, 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 the cyber world as it is the borderless cyberspace, the open freedom of the cyberspace. So I think this is a complicated issue and we have to look forward what will happen. So just in Baku two weeks ago or last week, there was now a proposal to produce a compendium which would include all these documents so that we have a better overview and then to see where are similarities between these various principles and declarations, where we have consensus, where we have rough consensus, and where we have disagreement. So probably the, the MAC, the, the Mighty Stakeholder Advisory Group for the IGF, could become the place where this discussion is pushed forward so that the next IGF in Bali or the IGF in 2014 or 15 could then adopt what I call a framework of commitments, uh, which would um, define these principles on a very high level, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, uh, very general principles where everybody can agree the internet should be free, the internet should be open, uh, the governance principle should be multi-stakeholder, uh, the internet should be safe and secure, like the Human Rights Declaration had with very general principles, freedom to travel, no torture, freedom of expression. So I think this is what is needed and only the IGF can do this because uh, the Council of Europe, with all respect, 
has 47 member states, but we have around 193 members of the United Nations. So it means we have to have this universal commitment from all governments. And not only from the governments, but we need the commitment also from the other stakeholders. It means such a framework of commitment should be accepted by the governments of China and, and, and the United States of America, should be accepted by ICANN and the IGF, should be accepted by Google and Facebook, and should be accepted by Human Rights Watch and the Association for Progressive Communication. So it means by all stakeholders. Whether this is achievable is, is a different question. But I think time is right that we discuss more clearly you know, with this um, with these principles. Uh, I mentioned already the Dubai conference remains to be seen what will happen. And I mentioned also the, uh, the, the Budapest conference, which is called the so-called London process or London agenda, which was started by the, uh, by the British Foreign Minister William Hague. So if you try to structure the principles, then um, um, you know, you'll see at least you know, four different, different um, chapters. Um, you know, I also agree, agree and think that it's really important to make clear that human rights is the starting point for all principles. So that's why the Declaration on Internet Governance Principles of the Council of Europe, the first principle is human rights rule of the law. And I think this should be always the beginning. Then it's important that we agree on the policy model. It's the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, the intergovernmental treaty system will not disappear. But in my eyes, the intergovernmental treaty system from the last century is now in the 21st century embedded in a multi-stakeholder environment. So it does not, is no argument against intergovernmental treaties. We have good treaties like the Cybercrime Convention, like you know, hundreds of treaties under international law. That's okay, but it's not the only thing you can manage the world via intergovernmental treaties. So you have to go beyond this. And in so far my argument is that the intergovernmental treaty system in the 21st century is embedded in a multi-stakeholder environment. This is still uncharted territory. We have not yet full knowledge how this works, how to implement this, how to practice this. But this is the beauty of the internet. We discover new worlds. And this is a very exciting discovery. So uh, it's important also in such a declaration that we agree on basic principles. Our open standards end-to-end -end, network security, stability, resilience, network neutrality. I think the Dubai conference is in so far a rather critical one because a lot of businesses are not happy with this open architecture. So they want to go back to the old telecommunication system there, which guaranteed a high income or you know all kinds of nice business arrangements. And the proposal which was done recently by the ETNO, the European um, organization of telecom operators, you know, uh, plans to introduce what they call a business class for the internet. It means if you want to have, you know, good connections, you have to pay more. If you just, you know, want to get your email, then it's no need to high speed, then uh, you, you get it more or less for free, or what we call at the moment the best effort. But at the moment, you know, routers and others, you know, servers make no difference whether in the package is a video or an image or a text or audio or whatever. So each packages, you know, from the end to end, you know, are treated in the same way called best effort. But if you introduce so a differentiated system, then you would uh, need also inspection what is in the package. That means on the way from the end to end, you have to open the package to look what is in and then you say, oh, this is a video, then you have to pay. So, and, but this is also an invitation for sensors because they are very happy if they could you know, open each package and say, oh, this is a critical remark against our president or you know, this is something you know, blasphemy against uh, uh, the Muslim brothers or whatever. So this really, uh, the, this deep packet inspection you know, uh, is justified partly by business arguments, but this opens the door for uh, an incredible censorship. So, and we should be aware about uh, these risks, and, and this is also part of the uh, discussion now in Dubai. That's why the, the architecture has, is, is, is fundamental if, if we come to such a framework of commitments for the internet. Keep the architecture as it is, open, end to end, and neutral. And then there are a lot uh, of, of public policy issues which uh, has to be uh, uh, covered by such a, such a declaration. Access data protection, intellectual property, fair competition, language and linguistic diversity and cyber security. So, um, 
at the moment the question is who should do what and where. That means we have to understand really the meaning of multi-stakeholderism. Who has the final authority in decision making and oversight? What we see now in ICANN in the introduction of new generic top level domains is more or less a battle about the right to have the last word. So the governmental advisory committee says, okay, we raise concerns, you know, we give you an advice, this is a good name, this is a bad name. So, and they expect that their advice is the last word. And the ICANN board says, okay, thank you for the advice, you know, your advice is not binding for the ICANN board, we will make our own decisions, we have our own dispute resolution mechanisms, you know, we will have the trademark clearing house now, and we will look at it. So it means, what is the, who is the final decision maker? The multi-stakeholder model says, there is no final decision maker. You have to collaborate and to find you know, a, 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 a common solution for that. And so the interesting point from the Toronto communicate in, in uh, three weeks ago uh, from the Government Advisory Committee was that now governments themselves propose what they call early engagement in policy development. So that means so far, governments were waiting until ICANN came with a proposal and then the government said it's good or it's bad. But you know, this has produced a lot of conflicts and confusion also because then the board said, okay, you are not the final decision maker. So, but an early engagement of governments means that governments participate on a very early stage in the development of a policy, which is done and driven by non-governmental stakeholders. So it means a new form of collaboration among civil society, technical community, uh, the, the civil society and the governments you know, are needed. So we have not yet in procedures there, so this has to be invented. This is part of the journey into this uncharted territory. So, and um, that means we have to clear what is the respective role of stakeholders. And now the, the new CEO from ICANN, Fadi, has introduced the terminology um, equal multi-stakeholder participation. So equal, in, in which understanding, what does it mean? Thirdly, we have to respect each other, so that means n no stakeholder should be treated in a, in, 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 in a very privileged form. So that means respective role and equality, equal footing, are two sides of a coin, but also this has to be better understood. So that means a nice concept which needs uh, further implementation. And then what are the appropriate bodies for political discussion? Is this ICANN? Is it the IGF? Is it the United Nations, the Commission for Science and Technology Development, which um, uh, you know, oversees the implementation of the UN World Summit on the Information Society? Is this the G7 or G8, the G20, the London process? Is this the IPSA, the Shanghai Group? But it means we have so many bodies, and we have to find out you know, uh, you know, where this public policy discussion should take place. And then what are the needed political legal instruments? In the past, we had just declarations, conventions, and resolutions and recommendations. This were more or less you know, what intergovernmental organizations did. But now we see new forms uh, which come out. Uh, affirmation of commitment. Is this a treaty? Is this a declaration? Or what it is? LOI, a letter of intent. So that means two parties uh, exchange letters and they write down their intention in the letter. And this is also a political outcome. It's a certain soft law binding force or whatever it is. An MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, it's also not a treaty, but it can have the effect of a treaty or a framework of commitment, FOC. So all these are new forms, but if you go back to the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, then you know the name of the document doesn't make a difference. It's the political will behind the, the signature, whether it's a letter or a framework or a affirmation or a declaration or whatever. So, checkpoint 2015, what will happen? I think you cannot dislink anymore the internet from the general political development. The financial crisis, globalization, uh, the role of governments, the Middle East, all of this affects the, um, the internet in a certain way. So the internet cannot be treated anymore isolated as um, something you know, which is not linked to the big uh, policy challenges. And this will certainly influence the internet. I think we have celebrated the Arab Spring because it, uh, the Arab Spring has removed some of these uh, dictators. But on the other hand, you know, the, the flip side of this is that uh, the Arab Spring has uh, you know, pushed forward the sensitivity of other dictators. 
about the internet. They understand it now much better, what can happen if they do not control the internet. So it means the Arab Spring you know, has a double effect. On the one hand, you know, it has created more freedom. On the other hand, it has invited other dictators to introduce more control and censorship over the internet. So it means you have to see both sides. And in so far, you cannot um, uh, ignore the, 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 the broader environment. Certainly, the priorities are changing. While the question of the critical internet resources, domain names, IP addresses, were in the center in 2005 when there was the Tunis summit. Now it's cybersecurity, social networks, Internet of Things, IFID chips, the ONS, the object naming system, international domain names, mobile internet, net neutrality, cloud computing, all these are new issues which were not at the agenda seven years ago. And we have no clue what will be in the agenda in five years from now. Because always new things are happening, innovation without permission. So, and so far, you know, we have to be very flexible also if it comes to regulation. On the one hand, not to close the doors and to stop innovation, but on the other hand, you know, to have frameworks, you know, which would allow that these new developments go in the right direction. For instance, if it comes to IFIDs and the Internet of Things, there are privacy issues are involved. So, if you have an RFD chip in your shoes, and you know somebody has access to your data, then uh, you know he knows immediately where your shoes are going. Probably you know you are not happy. Uh, the, the, every somebody or at least everybody who has access to your data, uh, you know, can follow every step you are doing. So this is a privacy issue, and this has to be certainly cleared. Uh, there is no need to have a special privacy directive for the Internet of Things. But if the European Commission now drafts the new privacy directive, they have to take this into consideration and to find certain ways, whether it's the right to silence the chip or whatever, you know, uh, to, um, uh, to deal with this. Um, I can is certainly changing. I think Fadi Shehane has now uh, uh, announced there's a new season for ICANN. ICANN of 2012 is different from ICANN of 2008 or ICANN 2003. So, but anyhow, it has to be seen. It means Fadi has to deliver a lot of promises which are now written on the wall. But you know what uh, will be the delivery and the next ICANN meeting in Beijing probably will already show where uh, we will go. So that means ICANN is still the pioneer in developing the multi-stakeholder model in the world. So that means we are speaking now about an enhanced multi-stakeholder model. How this will look like? Let's wait and see. So, and uh, it has to be seen also as a review mechanism, which I mentioned already, as ICANN oversight uh, mechanism. The work. So the next, the second round of the review starts in January 2013. Uh, there are now calls for nomination to become a member of the review team. I think this is probably another test to see, you know, how strong and independent ICANN is. The IGF is changing. We just came back from Baku. The next will be in Bali. I think everybody said Baku was a wonderful experience, but the IGF has to be changed. So we have to go. You know, avoid what we have. So it's the next step is needed. What the next step should be. So this is open for discussion. And then we have you know a number of uh, 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 activities under the United Nations. The the review for the um, uh, Tunis agenda, which is 10 plus, has just started. There will be probably another summit or a high level ministerial meeting uh, in 2014 or 2015 in Sharm uh, el-Sheikh in, in, in Egypt uh, and uh, whether this will be a third world summit or not has still to be decided. We have in the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations and in the CSTD uh, bodies, you know, which are dealing with this, there is the group of government experts dealing, you know, with the issues of cyber war, cyber weapons and confidence building measures in the uh, cyber military field. Uh, this is done mainly in the first committee of the General Assembly of the United Nations. The Council for Internet Related Policies, the Indian, Brazilian and South African proposal is under discussion in the second committee. The, uh, and, and, and so that means the United Nations General Assembly will play a role also in the future. We should not forget this. Then there's the ITU, there's WIPO, there's the World Trade Organizations and there are the G8 and the G20 know which will deal with this and this brings me to my final slide. If you look ahead in the year 2020 then we will have certainly five billion internet users, probably even more, six or seven. I don't know how many people will live in 2020.
2020 or the globe, but uh, nearly everybody will have access to the internet in 2020. And this will be a multilingual internet. So that means uh, we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, Cyrillic and BG and the EU. So, um, you know, the, 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 the minister from India, we had a meeting with him in, in Baku, just <coughs> made clear in India they have around 300 different languages and 12 different scripts. So that means that India is 1.5 million people uh, and will be, the, let's say, one of the main internet nations um, in the year 2020. So that means we have to understand this, that the internet will go beyond its um, Latin script dominated uh, face. We will see all kinds of converged service, whether this is Web 3.0 or 4.0, I don't know. But I think as long as it's digitalized, everything can be combined with everything. So it means traditional borders. You know, when I was a child, a telephone was a telephone, a camera was a camera, a TV set was a TV set. So now everything in one device. So we had no computers when I, in, in, in the 60s when I lived in East Germany. So, and, uh, but um, now it's everything in, in one device. I can hear it. It's my camera. It's my computer. And I can make phone calls. So it means everything was different regulated. We had a broadcasting law, we had a telecommunication law, we had various laws for, for various services. Now how you can legally separate such a device and say, okay, this is regulated by telecommunication law, this is regulated by broadcasting law, this is regulated by press law, you can't do that anymore. So it means the, the, the technology, the convergence, you know, undermines traditional, traditional separations. And we will have certainly a multi-stakeholder governance model. I'm sure that there is no alternative for it. All the efforts to renationalize the internet, to bring it back under national control, will fail. But it's, uh, it takes some time. There will be a battle. So the, the battle will continue. I do not say that we will have a solution until 2020. But this will become the dominant forms. And the internet of things, probably we go beyond the domain name system. We have other forms of identifiers. Already young people do not really use anymore emails or domain names. In Facebook, they just click and then they are linked. So I think this is our open questions whether you know, all the uh, noise about new generic top level domains is just you know, <coughs> noise and will collapse also in three or five years. Nobody knows that. Um, as, what are the main conflicts in my eyes? So we will have, um, if it comes to the network, this battle between the universal borderless network, the unified network, or fragmentation of the internet. I think the nationalization, renationalization, fragmentation of the internet is a real challenge, and this will continue. I'm an optimist. I think you know this will, the, the internet will remain basically uh, a unified space, but. Uh, I, I'm realistic enough to see this is the subject of the battle. We will have debates about the policy, top-down versus bottom-up. I think traditional power structures will not give up their policies. We say a power shift, and each power shift is, you know, follows, uh, is followed by a power struggle, and then a redistribution of power. And we are in the midst of this power struggle, you know, how to redistribute power. And this is, you know, from uh, top-down hierarchical decision-making procedure to a uh, bottom-up, you know, more decentralized open decision-making procedures. This remains a battle, although, let's say, for the next uh, 5, 10, 20 years. And then, you know, uh, the management of all this. Will this remain a multi-stakeholder self-organizing mechanism or will we go back to very strong governmental or commercial control? I think an unholy alliance would be, you know, if uh, very uh, authoritative regimes go together with uh, commercial companies and say, okay, you get the power, we get the money, and then let's make a deal. And then, you know, the civil society, the small user would be the big loser if big government and big industry goes together. I think this is, this is a, a real challenge and we should be aware that this is an open problem. But whatever happens, one thing is for sure, the internet governance will remain the subject of high-level political controversy, and it will be about, and you cannot read it, money and power. So it means we know 2000th history of mankind is a battle on money and power, and the internet will not change this. The internet is in the midst of a battle on power and money, and you should not forget it. With all the idealism we have, with all the nice plans we have, power and money plays an important role, and it's not um, 
And, but we have a unique chance in the history that now we have an enabled, empowered new player. And these are the users, this is this, uh, the civil society, this is also the technical community. That means power gets more diversified. So that means uh, power did not disappear, but the nature of power has changed from a centralized uh, power into a probably a decentralized power mechanism. Thank you for your attention.